Bible prophecy, the foretelling of future events, mysterious, faint and unclear, like a fog. Yet, in the mist is often a clear. Thou, O King, sawest and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. His breast and arms of silver, thighs of brass, legs of iron. Thou sawest till that a stone cut out without hands. This is the dream. I'm not looking forward to it. Everything's just going to keep going as normal. A lot of wars. We can't even begin to think about the increase in technology. Cash society with lots of problems. A new world order. You know, certain things like ozone and overpopulation, that type of stuff. What about you? Do you think there's any truth to the warnings of the modern-day prophets of doom? Is the world really teetering on the brink of catastrophe? Could indeed a comet or meteor collide with Earth and obliterate life on our planet? Will unparalleled natural disasters such as catastrophic earthquakes or floods destroy entire cities or countries? Will a breakdown in our computer system cause an abrupt ending to civilization as we know it? Or will mankind simply destroy itself? While earth-shattering meteors and invading alien armies can be brushed aside as the stuff of Hollywood movies, many of the events reported on the evening news are cause for genuine concern. Ethnic cleansing, new wars, kids killing kids, countries on the verge of economic collapse, breakthroughs in cloning and genetic engineering, New killer diseases with no known cures, widespread destruction and loss of life caused by radically changing weather patterns, rises in domestic and international terrorism, to name a few. And where is technology headed? Will the microchip solve the world's problems and give everyone more time to enjoy life? Or is it preparing the way for an all-seeing, all-knowing Big Brother state? And while the internet promises to make life easier by connecting you with millions of people the world over, could it be the undoing of your family and privacy? According to surveys, nearly six in ten Americans believe the world will come to an end or be destroyed sometime in the future. 49% believe there will be an antichrist, and 44% believe there will be a final battle of Armageddon. Will there be an Armageddon? According to Bible prophecy, yes, but not yet. Some earth-shaking events need to happen first, events that are detailed in the prophetic scriptures of the Old and New Testament. Amazingly, out of the 66 books in the Bible that comprise the Jewish Old and the Christian New Testaments, 18 are devoted entirely to prophecy or foretelling of specific future events, and almost every other book contains significant prophecies of some sort. Israel, the land of prophecy. More prophets have walked this dusty, narrow strip of land that averages just 50 miles wide and 250 miles long than any other place on earth. Jewish prophets have foretold in incredible detail not only the history of their own people, but the rise and fall of empires, as well as the ultimate destiny of mankind. One of the simplest of the prophet Daniel's prophecies is his interpretation of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. It is one of the most amazing prophecies ever given to man. The king's dream was of a great image with a head of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron his feet, 
part of iron and part of clay. Then a stone cut out without hands smote the image on its feet. The image crumbled into dust and was blown away by the wind. But the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. In this amazing vision, each of the different parts of the image symbolizes a different empire that God foretold would rule the world. Daniel himself told King Nebuchadnezzar, You are this head of gold. Babylon was known as the Golden City in ancient times, and like the head, the Babylonians were great thinkers, knowing astronomy, astrology, and science. Just as the image had two arms, the next world empire was an alliance of the Medes and the Persians, who conquered Babylon in 538 BC. They were very clever with their hands, being experts at handicrafts and with building. The Medo-Persian Empire was conquered in 333 BC by Greece, who God likened to the belly of the image. The people of the Greek Empire were known to be hedonistic pleasure seekers, symbolized here by the belly or the desires of the flesh. Rome was the next world empire, symbolized by the image's two legs of iron. Rome was the strongest of the world empires, ruling the world with an iron fist. Like two legs, it was divided into an eastern and western empire. Also like a pair of legs, the Romans were great on marching. The legs are the longest part of the image, and of all the world's empires, Rome ruled the longest for nearly 1,000 years. Since Rome, the world has been divided into various other empires, but none strong enough to rule the whole known world of its time. And what about the stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands and smote the image on the feet, smashing it to pieces? The prophecies of Daniel may seem somewhat complicated, but it is very significant that we can understand them at all because God himself told Daniel. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. For the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. But the book of Daniel today is a little bit more clear. First, because of the establishment of Israel, I believe. Secondly, because several things have happened already in the history that Daniel predicted and happened. Some of it had to do with the vision of uh, the image that King Nebuchadnezzar have seen with the different, you know, uh, uh, main powers that will control the earth and what will happen. As we follow that study carefully, we can see uh, very clearly uh, the description of uh, the Persian Empire, then the Greek Empire, then the Roman Empire, and then... Uh, a situation as we have today, a clay mixed with iron, things that are, you know, not very clear as they used to be in the past, which we have in our modern democratic society. And so when you follow that, you can follow a little bit the book and see the fulfillment of some of the prophetic words. So it's not as sealed as it used to be. I do believe there are certain things that are still hidden from our eyes that Daniel talks about. And a good study, a thorough study, will open it up uh, before those who really uh, study it, along with the book of Revelation. So do we have an idea of what the feet and the ten toes spoken of by Daniel the prophet symbolize? Many Bible scholars agree on a particularly striking interpretation of this part of the image, much of which also has to do with Israel and its future history. But before we delve into the prophecies of the future, Let's look at fulfilled prophecy to see how God communicates through prophetic language. It could be said that both the Jewish and the Arab races were conceived in prophecy. God told Abraham, the father of both races, to get out of the country of Haran to a land that he would show him. Scripture tells us that Abraham obeyed and went out not knowing whither he went. God promised Abraham I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. A seeming impossibility, as not only was Sarah, his wife, childless, she was 90 years of age. 
Thus, Abraham's first son, Ishmael, was born to an Egyptian woman named Hagar, Sarah's handmaid. Ishmael became the father of the 12 Arab nations that are today spread across both Asia and Africa. In Genesis 17.20, God speaks about Ishmael. I will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. The following year, at ninety-one years of age, Sarah gave birth to Isaac, who was to be the father of Jacob, whose twelve sons became the patriarchs of the twelve Jewish tribes. If you were to view an interactive map of Israel, you could click on virtually any town or historical site and find it to be an integral part of some prophecy. And nowhere more so than the old city of Jerusalem, throughout the ages the religious capital of the world and center of the world's three greatest religions. This is Zion Gate, a gate to a part of the city built by David, the shepherd boy turned king. Zion was David's great love, and his famous psalms are full of poetic and prophetic expressions about it. Now his body is laid to rest in this tomb on the spot that he loved. Mount Zion originally meant the city of David. It was once the most important part of Jerusalem, but later became a plowed field fulfilling Micah's prophecy. Zion shall be plowed as a field. After David's death, King Solomon, his son, built the first Jewish temple up there on Mount Moriah, the spot where Abraham intended to sacrifice his son Isaac in obedience to God's command. From then on, Mount Moriah became the Zion, the most significant of all sacred places for both the Jewish prophets and others of those centuries. The first temple built by King Solomon was destroyed in 586 BC by the Babylonian army of King Nebuchadnezzar. Rebuilt in 516 BC, the second temple stood on this spot for 656 years until it was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. A fulfillment of a prophecy given by Jesus. Shortly before his death, he told his disciples, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Jesus predicted that the temple would be torn stone from stone, a prophecy literally fulfilled 40 years later by the Roman army of Emperor Vespasian under General Titus. Jerusalem was sacked and burned and a hundred thousand Jews crucified on crosses throughout the city. The Romans then burnt the temple building itself, which was made largely of wood, embellished with gold and silver. The melted gold and silver ran down between the cracks of the great stones of the foundation. The Romans then tore the foundation stones apart to get at the melted gold and silver. So not one stone was left standing upon another a literal fulfillment of the prophecy of Jesus Christ. All that was left of the temple was this large stone retaining wall that shored up the earth to make a level top on Mount Moriah for the temple to sit on. Now it's known as the Western Wall, where Jews come to pray. After the sacking of Jerusalem by the Romans in 70 AD, the Jewish people were scattered into every nation on the face of the earth. The Diaspora, prophesied by Moses in the book of Leviticus. And I will scatter you among the heathen, and will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. For almost 1900 years, they held on to the many prophecies in the sacred writings of the Old Testament that they would one day return. This is probably the most explosive piece of religious real estate in the world. Mount Moriah, the hallowed spot where throughout Jewish history, the Jews conducted their animal sacrifices. 
According to Islamic tradition, this is where the Prophet Muhammad ascended up to heaven in the early 7th century. According to Bible prophecy, this is also where the third Jewish temple will be built. This is the Mosque of Omar, built in 688 AD. It is also called the Dome of the Rock, because inside is the rock on which Abraham started to sacrifice his son, Isaac. Having been overwhelmingly Christian for the 600 years of Roman and Byzantine rule, the Arab conquest of 641 AD brought Palestine under the sway of Islam. Then, in 1099, the European Crusaders took Jerusalem and established a feudal kingdom that lasted until 1291, when the Europeans were expelled by the Egyptians. In 1516, Palestine became part of the Turkish Ottoman Empire for 600 years, until the British captured it in 1918, at the end of World War I. A Muslim prophecy foretold that Jerusalem would be conquered by a prophet of God and surrender without a shot. So, as General Allenby, chief of the British forces and his army, surrounded Jerusalem, the inhabitants, on hearing his name, surrendered without resistance, because Alan Bey, in Arabic, means prophet of God. And it was here, at the gate of the Tower of the Citadel of David, that General Allenby proclaimed victory on behalf of the British and Allied forces. The British ruled Palestine for 30 years from 1918 to 1948 and left their mark here, building many Christian churches and restoring archaeological sites and, unknowingly, helping to fulfill another prophecy. This is the city of Haifa, gem of the Mediterranean and gateway to Israel. Above it stands Mount Carmel, on which the prophet Elijah slew the 450 false prophets of Baal. In the book of Genesis, the Jewish patriarch Jacob predicted that this land of Zebulun would become a haven for ships. For thousands of years, ships couldn't dock here because of the shallow bay. But after the British deepened the harbor in the 1930s, Haifa became Israel's largest port. On May the 14th, 1948, Israel was reborn as a nation, the fulfillment of numerous Old Testament prophecies, one of which states, And he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The formation of Israel as a state holds great significance for Jews and Christians alike. One major sign that I personally believe that is uh, an indicator to the fact that we are, uh, whether the threshold or already at the beginning of the end time, is the establishment of the uh, modern state of Israel. Uh, here is a, a, a phenomena that have been predicted in the word hundreds of times. The Old Testament is full of prophetic word about the restoration of Israel. While Christians search the prophetic scriptures for signs of the return of Christ, the Jews look for signs of the coming of the Messiah. Orthodox Jews have long taught that the world would last for 6,000 years, after which the Messiah would come and usher in a 1,000-year period of restful human history. Since God created the world in six days, according to Genesis 1.31, and rested on the seventh day, according to Genesis 2.2, they reasoned that world history would climax in the same way. The world should be supposed to be 6,000 years, the first 2,000 is until Abraham. When Abraham was 52 years old, was the first 2,000. Then he had a covenant with God that will be his God and will give him the land. The second 2,000, the middle 2,000, was from between 2 to 4, is the, th is the 2,000 where the prophecies are being written. The Bible and all, the entire Bible. The last 2,000 is from the destruction of the second temple. It comes, by the way, by the dot to the year. Another time we have to explain that. So the last 2,000 is a 2,000 of the era of Mashiach. They also cite Psalm 90 verse 4, which says, For a thousand years in thy sight are like yesterday when it passes by, 
Likewise, Christians have looked to 2 Peter 3, 8. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Same with the creation, sixth day of creation. The, sa the seventh day is the last thousand, is the day of God, kingdom is totally revealed in the world. The rebuilding of Solomon's temple on the Temple Mount has been so important to Jews that they've prayed for it for centuries and end each wedding with the breaking of a glass to remind participants of the temple's destruction. In fact, the construction of the third Jewish temple is far beyond the planning stage. Here, in the middle of a roundabout, not far from the Damascus Gate of the old city of Jerusalem, is what some consider to be the cornerstone of the new temple. The Bible tells us, and you shall make for me a sanctuary that I will dwell among you. So that's really the, the uh, comprehensive commandments regarding the construction of the temple. And then there are many other commandments as well. Um, the commandments really can be fulfilled today in a number of ways, kind of um, in abstentia or maybe kind of in a piecemeal fashion in view of the uh, impediments towards actually building the temple until such time as uh, it, it, you know, is more fitting. So the main way that the Institute is going about the fulfillment of the commandment and, and occupying itself with the goal of trying to do really as much as possible in our time towards the temple is by creating the vessels. So the vessels that are um, being created today are not just models or replicas but are actually made in accordance to the biblical requirements and therefore are really ready to be used according to biblical law and can be used in the, in the new temple. There is plans, sure there is plan. As a matter of fact, there is places in Jerusalem that they're already building the vessels and they're learning like in yeshivas, like here in Mount Zion we have a yeshiva, we have a university for Jewish studies. They learn all the different laws that has to do with the sacrifices and all the different laws that has to do with the temple. And they prepare them, they're preparing themselves if they're pre priests, they come from the tribe of Levites. So then they prepare themselves to, to, to be ready and all this come to unfold will be ready to serve God in the temple. We believe that this is the destiny of the Jewish people and that we are commanded to be occupied with the building of the temple just as we are commanded to sanctify God's name in every other way. Um, so no, we're not really waiting for the Messiah. We don't feel that uh, his arrival is a prerequisite for the building of the temple. Its reconstruction, however, is unthinkable because for the temple to be rebuilt, the Mosque of Omar would have to be torn down igniting a certain holy war between the Jews and the Arabs. Enter the Antichrist, a politically brilliant and charismatic personality prophesied of in the Bible, who rescues the world from near collapse due to desperate social and economic problems yet to occur. This tactful genius accomplishes the unbelievable feat of world peace. And according to Bible prophecy, becomes the adoration of the whole world. Let's go back to Daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Daniel has covered the major kingdoms or empires of the world, starting with Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar's own kingdom. One last section of the image representation of world history remains. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. A kingdom is only such if it has a king. In this case, the prophecy is referring to the Antichrist. Daniel later explains to us that these ten toes symbolize ten kings that give their allegiance and backing to the Antichrist for a time. Iron representing the hard dictatorial governments and clay, the soft democratic ones. And as the iron does not mix with clay, so these two ideologies will be opposing governments. What else does the Bible tell us about this powerful person? He shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. He solves the problems of the Middle East and signs a seven-year peace accord or covenant 
that gives Jews, Muslims, and Christians equal rights to the old city of Jerusalem and the temple area. Part of this accord allows the Jews to rebuild their temple. How he solves the problem of where it is to be built is still a mystery, though scriptures indicate that he will find a way. As we know, the Antichrist will be a figure of man who proclaim peace that will attract the world with a, uh, what we call today the New World Order, uh, you know, very similar kind of concept, uh, a New World Order of peace and harmony and tranquility, of living together. Uh, that person will be very attractive, probably very intelligent, and very uh, 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 well able to communicate, where he will attract people to believe in, in uh, the peaceful solutions that he will bring to humanity. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for seven years. The prophet Daniel says that the Antichrist will work deceitfully and uses the word fire to describe it. Having people's trust and adoration after 42 months or three and a half years into his reign, he abruptly breaks his peace covenant with Israel and invades from the north, stopping the temple worship and revealing his true character and intentions. Prophecy indicates that it is at this time that this world leader becomes possessed of Satan and declares himself God. The devil all along is trying to imitate God. He's trying to be like God, trying to rebel against God by being as strong and as powerful in influencing mankind like God does. And so the Antichrist will have a lot of uh, aspects that will appear as, you know, portrayed for the Messiah, for Christ. He may be a very powerful man. He may even do some uh, supernatural acts. We don't know. He uh, may have some power given to him by the devil that, that will create some supernatural manifestations. Yes, I do believe people will confuse him with Christ. And, and those that are not deeply engaged with the relationship with God and understand the word of God good today may fall into that deception. Prophecy tells us, The man of sin shall be revealed, the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. It was here, on the Mount of Olives, that Jesus added very clear instruction to Daniel's prophecy, telling his followers what to do when the Antichrist causes the sacrifice to cease in the temple and sets up the abomination of desolation, his own image as a deity, right there on the holy place of the Temple Mount. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains, let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. The abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet and Jesus is also called the image of the beast in the book of Revelation. Based on prophecy description, it may be some kind of giant computerized machine that can speak and command that anyone anywhere who refuses to worship it be killed. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. This is when the Antichrist insists that everyone receive the mark of the beast, perhaps a computer chip inserted in their forehead, or an identification number in their hand, which permits them to buy or sell and without which they cannot trade. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, 
and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. And his number is 666. For the first time in history, technological infrastructure is in place for a world dictator to fulfill this kind of a cashless, big brother society. Cash is disappearing. Plastic cards with magnetic strips or computer chips are replacing notes and coins. Not everyone is taken in by the Antichrist, however, and he is unable to completely enforce his worldwide rule. Daniel foretells that some nations will rebel against him, particularly Christian, Jewish and Muslim nations, most of whom zealously reject idol worship. The Antichrist retaliates, initiating one of the worst mass persecution of peoples in history and about which Jesus states, Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. This worldwide manhunt, reminiscent of but surpassing the Roman persecution of the early Christians, lasts for three and a half years and is known as the Great Tribulation. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Three and a half years after the Antichrist sets up his image, Jesus returns in the clouds where every eye shall see him. He gathers his followers who have remained faithful through the Antichrist's great persecution and literally takes them off the earth, meeting them in the air. His faithful out of the way, judgment begins on the Antichrist and his followers. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways, and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went, and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which had power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast. And his kingdom was full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. And the water thereof dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. This is the Valley of Megiddo, also known as the Esdralon Valley. Armageddon in Hebrew means the height of Megiddo, which is this dome-shaped hill that I'm standing upon. When Napoleon stood here and looked out across this great valley, he said, what a place for a battle. When General Pershing saw it, he said, what a place to fight a tactical war. It is around this historic mount that Bible prophecy indicates a colossal battle between good and evil will be fought. In heaven, the armies of the Lord prepare for battle. 
On Earth, the Antichrist and his forces are engaged in a conflict of their own as they combat disloyal rebel forces. It is while the Antichrist is engaged in battle that Jesus and his resurrected saints come to the fore with a literal invasion from heaven. The Antichrist turns his weapons against the celestial forces, and a battle like no other on Earth ensues. The Battle of Armageddon. During Armageddon, the prayers of those who have long cried out for justice are answered as God's patience with man's evil ways reaches its limit. The noise of a multitude in the mountains like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. They come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and greatly into pieces. Jesus is often referred to as the cornerstone, the beginning of a new and spiritual temple foundation. Just as the stone was cut without hands and came hurling to destroy the image in Daniel chapter 2, so Jesus, the Son of God, comes from heaven to lay a final blow to the Antichrist's kingdom. The prophet Daniel says that the battle of Armageddon will rage for 45 days. The Antichrist is cast into a lake of fire and his evil followers slain. The carnage is so great that the prophet Ezekiel says that in Israel alone it will take seven months just to bury the dead and seven years to clean up the twisted metal of wrecked armaments. The battle won, Jesus steps once more upon the earth, right over there on the Mount of Olives. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Seismologists tell us that the Mount of Olives lies on an earthquake fault, and that a six inch wide crack runs across the top of the hill from north to south. Uh, when we look at Mount of Olives, which is right uh not far away from where we're sitting right now, uh, we can see that the literal fulfillment of this verse can very easily uh, happen. One thing we do know is that Christ will come physically. His appearance is very important because people, it says the eyes of men will behold him. Uh, there's also going to be a supernatural manifestations all over. The whole earth at one minute will see him. And so there should, there would be some kind of a a supernatural phenomena from the heavenlies that will attract the entire attention of the earth. It has to be. And then those who will live around here, specifically this verse is for them, uh, they probably will see some manifestations on the Mount of Olives and uh, Christ that are different than if I look today at Mount of Olives and see the mountain sitting there in its tranquility and, you know, peaceful uh, fashion, I'm sure it will be different then. There will be a lot of commotion, there will be a lot of uh, uh, supernatural manifestations that God will reveal himself through Christ and uh, and, and Christ himself will come and will uh, land, I believe, right on the Mount of Olives. And then, of course, uh, we have there a, a large graveyard right now of all peop many people, even uh, David's tomb and others, that uh, believe that uh, because Christ or the Messiah, the Jewish people, even non-Christians, believe the same way, that when Christ will, or the Messiah will come, those will be the first to, resurrect, to be resurrected because they are in 
uh, buried in Mount of Olives or close to the Mount of Olives. And uh, so again, there will be a lot of the resurrection part. There will be the commotion of his arrival. There may be the split of the mountain. The the you know all the um, functions of the heavenly sun, moons, and stars will take different shape. And so we are expecting a real dramatic moments around here. This is the Golden Gate, the gate through which Jesus passed on his last entry into Jerusalem, when the people cried, Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David, and hailed him as king. It is now walled up, as you can see. It is said that one of the Muslim rulers of Israel remembered a prophecy from Muhammad in the Quran that when Jesus returns, he will enter in through the gate called Beautiful to take over the city of Jerusalem and reign as the king of kings. Afraid that Jesus might come and usurp his throne, he walled up the gate to try to keep him out and thus fulfilled Ezekiel's prophecy. This gate shall be shut, it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter in by it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it, therefore it shall be shut. And what about the last part of the prophecy found in the book of Daniel, after the rock smites the image? Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever this stone smiting the image signifies the end of man's kingdoms and rule on earth compare this stone with the following verses and the interpretation becomes very clear. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. At last, the world will be governed fairly, with true justice, liberty, peace, plenty, and happiness for all. No longer will reign the cruel, selfish philosophy that gives the world to the strongest and to the mightiest, in which might is right. There'll be no more crime, vice, corruption, bribery, or injustice. Jesus, his angels, and his resurrected followers establish a righteous government with true justice for all. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. For the Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked, and the scepter of the rulers. The whole earth is at rest, and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Millennium. It's a Latin word meaning a thousand years, used by Bible prophecy students as a name for this amazing period, this golden age of peace on earth. During the millennium, while the Antichrist is cast into the lake of fire, the devil who possessed him is bound in chains and imprisoned in the heart of the earth, in the bottomless pit. With the devil gone and the earth relieved of many of the curses that have beset it, the earth will return to how it was in the days of Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert, and the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water, and the desolate land shall be tilled, and they shall say, this land that was desolate is become like the Garden of Eden. First of all, we know that uh, the devil and everything that he represents, which is, uh, uh, you know, the, the negative, the ugly, the difficult part of humanity, uh, will be taken out, will be locked, will be uh, away from the experience, of day, day to day experiences of, of mankind. The second thing that we know is that God would dwell with men again. 
Uh, it gives me back the picture of Garden of Eden. God was walking in the garden. Adam and Eve are there. It was a natural relationship between them. It wasn't like today you have to go somewhere, uh, you know, to the ends of the earth to go to a revival where uh, people say the Spirit of God is moving and, uh, you know, you need to go to Toronto, you need to go to uh, uh, different places to, to get that uh, spiritual. It was natural uh, experience for Adam and Eve to have God you know, involved in their life. I think it will be the same in the millennium. God will be part of our life in all the aspects of our life and it will not be something religious. It will be natural. It will be a beautiful relationship of love and harmony between man and God. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them and the cow and the bear shall feed their young ones, shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Humanity will not be an enemy to each other. Uh, I mean, you know, a lion and a, and a, and a lamb uh, cannot dwell together today. But also uh, in Yugoslavia, for example, the Serb and the, and the Albanians cannot live together. And in Turkey, the Kurdish you know, Kurdistan people and the Turkish cannot live together, and in Israel the Arabs and the Jews cannot live together. In other words, the same picture that we see of the animal world, that, that, that this, this uh, you know, uh, violent action for survival and all this aggression between uh, certain groups of animals to others, we see that in humanity in a different way. Since in the millennium, uh, the whole concept of humanity will be different. There will be love, harmony, hate will be gone, and all the you know, the negative effect of the devil influence of our life and our flesh and all that stuff will not be uh, uh, the prevalent thing, but the spiritual aspect of, of God and our positive aspect of our characters will be the things that will really uh, be, uh, uh, you know, the strongest uh, emphasis in the millennium. I think also nature will behave in the same way. I think uh, God will change the shape, the, the, the heart of animals. And I think uh, there will be provision for a lion to eat without uh, a need to destroy or to kill a lamb. And I think also their nature will be changed because uh, God will touch the entire creation. And in the millennium, everything will be under God and with God. And I believe also uh, you'll see that uh, it will affect the animals, it will affect the birds, it will affect, uh, uh, you know, every creature on the face of earth for 1,000 years. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. The devil will be locked for a thousand years and then later on he will be released. So there will be some kind of uh, connection uh, to him that we don't understand how it will be. But those will be immobile, un unable to uh, influence society for a thousand years. They are limited in those thousand years with their powers and their ability to influence humanity. In the Millennial Kingdom, the world will return to using forms of transportation that don't pollute the environment, such as horses or camels, wagons or beautiful stately sailing ships. There'll be no more big cities or heavy industry or big smoke-belching factories and destructive machinery. The world will return to being a largely agrarian society, living in small, peaceful, homey, rural communities. It won't be as though the world is going backwards in time. There'll still be modern conveniences and advanced technologies, but nothing that would cause damage to people or to the environment. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. These citizens of heaven are the past faithful of all ages who served God. They are at times referred to as the resurrected saints, whose bodies are now similar to Jesus' body at the time of his resurrection. During the millennium, those with resurrected bodies will interact with those who have normal earthly bodies, much in the same way as Jesus did with his disciples after his resurrection. A body which, as St. Paul says, is sown in corruption but raised 
in incorruption. He shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. Scripture assures us that the reign of Jesus Christ over the earth during the millennium will be a reign of purity and true justice. It will not be the same Christ that we knew as a suffering Messiah who is going to die for our sins. It's going to be the king, the warrior, the uh, judge, uh, the majestic, powerful arm of God. And the picture of that Messiah uh, will be implemented in the person of uh, Christ when he comes back. And so we're talking about tangibles. We're talking about something that we can see, we can touch, we can feel. So it will be a phys uh, physical presence of Christ that will be among us. And I will believe that he will dwell among us in this thousand years. It will be our King, our Lord, and uh, the one whom we worship and adore. The prophecies that we've covered in this film are merely a few of the literally thousands of fulfilled prophecies about empires, individuals, and world events which the biblical prophets foretold with unerring accuracy. These same prophets have told us time and time again that God will set up a heavenly kingdom of love, joy, and happiness, ruling the earth through His resurrected followers. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey Him. God has given man his chance to try to solve his own problems and bring peace and happiness to the world. And if God did not step in and intervene in this last hour of world history, man would probably destroy the earth and annihilate himself. That is why Jesus prophesied of the last days, except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. Indeed, the Bible tells us that the world will go from bad to worse. The Bible also promises, however, that as man reaches his extremity, God will intervene and restore the earth to the paradisical state that countless millions have prayed for throughout the centuries and continue to pray for every day. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.